my heart is just, ah, thank you for remembering, Monica. <laughs> yes, we are recording this. So we hope uh, that um, you share it with your friends if you're interested. We want to get the word out about Ecomadres and the wonderful work they're doing. Um, so Monica and I will kick things off and then we're going to hand it over to them. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Michelle Melendez and with me is Monica Van Hillebrandt. We are the co-leads of Latinos at EDF. And Latinos at EDF celebrates the passion and diverse cultures of people who have roots in Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries. We identify ourselves in many ways by country of origin, as Hispanic, as Latinos, Latinas or Latinx and beyond. We honor our differences and what unites us, including our deep respect for the environment and our desire to make EDF a more inclusive organization. Latinos at EDF strives to provide a safe space, an educational space, and a social space where all are welcome. We launched Latinos at EDF last year as part of EDF's Innovative Diversity Efforts Alliance, which you may know as the IDEA groups, employee-led groups that explore and celebrate diversity at EDF. We have members from across the organization and you don't have to be Latino to join. So we hope that you, if you're not a member, please do join us. Um, we're so glad to bring you this special conversation during Hispanic Heritage Month. And for me, as a mom, as a Latina, and as someone who cares about the environment, the women of Eco Madres have a warm place in my heart. Um, and for a little more context about what you'll be hearing about in the next hour, I will kick it off to my lovely colleague, Monica. Thank you, Michelle. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Monica von Hillebrand, and I've been with EDF for about five years and very excited for this conversation. Um, so when Dominique Browning, the director and co-founder of Moms Clean Air Force, told us about the work of the Women of Eco Madres, eh, we immediately wanted to meet them and obviously share their story. So we're thrilled to be able to do, to do that today. A born from a meaningful partnership between Moms Clean Air Force and founding partner Green Latinos, Eco Madres bring Latinas moms together to address issues of clean air, climate, and toxics that affect the health of Latino children and families. We'll be hearing from Cynthia Moore, the Eco Madres national lead, and her colleagues Columba Sainz and Yaritza Perez on how they got started what they are working on and how having a Latino background shapes and influences this important work. We'll have some time near the end to take your questions and a, you really, we really do encourage you to stick around because we also a, will be sharing some heartwarming photos of the Eco Madres work. So with that being said, please take it away, Cynthia. Thank you so much, Monica and Michelle. Um, Hi, I'm Cynthia Moore, the lead organizer for the Eco Madres program of Moms Clean Air Force. We are excited to have you join us today for this Hispanic Heritage Month event and appreciate the invitation to introduce our Eco Madres work to our colleagues at the Environmental Defense Fund. The Eco Madres program was born from a meaningful collaboration between Moms Clean Air Force and founding partner Green Latinos in October 2018. Eco Madres was created because Moms Clean Air Force saw that there was a need to provide a safe space for parents in the Latino community to share their stories and to address issues of air quality, climate, and toxics. Oftentimes, many in the Latino community are left behind due to the lack of language access, information, and outreach. Eco Madres works to bridge the gap through engaging and empowering Latino families to have conversations with lawmakers about the environment's effect on our children's health. When the program started just three years ago, it was launched in two states, Arizona and New Mexico. Since then, we have added Eco Madres programs and organizers in five additional states, Colorado, Florida, Iowa, Nevada, and Texas. Originally, the community came together in smaller settings and events called cafecitos. Our organizers would bring pan dulce and coffee to our host houses, community centers, or churches. However, when the pandemic began in 2020 and many states shut down, we had to shift gears. We moved all of our cafecitos online, hosting them live on Facebook, 
with many of our partners. This allowed us to have a much more broader national reach to discuss issues such as climate change, air pollution, and the importance for us to vote during the 2020 election. Today, I am joined by my colleagues from Lumba Science in Arizona and Yaritza Perez in Florida, who are Eco Madres field organizers working on the ground in their respective states. We would like to share with you a little bit about ourselves and why we were inspired to get involved in this work. And now I would like to introduce Columba. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Columba Sainz, and I am the state organizer for Moms Green Air Force and Ecomadres with our Latino community. I am a mother of three small children, and I truly live in a hot spot. Arizona, it's experiencing wildfires and extreme hot days, both driven by climate change. Here in Phoenix, we have an additional problem. Our air is unsafe to breathe. It has not been easy to let my kids be kids outside. My husband and I already have to move more than once in the search of a place to safely raise our family far from the threat of air pollution. We thought we had found the perfect place, five minute commute to my husband's work, right in front of a park and next to a child care center. My babies will spend two to three hours at the park every day so they could explore and stay healthy and not watch too much TV, I thought. But unfortunately, after two months, my oldest daughter, Columba, started whizzing at the age of two in the middle of the night. I panicked and we took and we took her to the doctor the next day where she was prescribed an inhaler and asthma medicine. Soon after I started to do some research and I saw how my daughter's wheezing could be tied to our bad air quality. I was shocked to discover that Phoenix gets an F grade for high ozone days and particle pollution. In fact, we experienced 117 days of high ozone this past year alone. After learning more about how air pollution contributes to climate change and how these things disproportionately impact brown and black communities, I knew I needed to advocate for better policies and protections on behalf of all families. Families who can at least afford it, they pay the highest price of inaction. They suffer health problems, miss school days, miss work, miss days at the daycare. In my community, every hour at work counts. We do not have the privilege to miss even an hour of work. In South Phoenix, too many Latinos are facing serious hardships, whether it's a starting over after being displaced by a wildfire, getting medical care for respiratory issues, affording air conditioning, floods. The burden is just too high. And this burden on top of other daily injustices such as racism, unemployment, and the lack of health insurance, it shouldn't be this way. And it's why we fight for environmental justice and the fight for racial equality are inseparable. We cannot advance one without the other. My activism with Eco Madres is where I feel that I have the opportunity to meet parents across Arizona, Tucson, Phoenix, Flagstaff, Sedona, who like me are living with the impacts of dangerous air pollution, which contributes to climate change. When I first joined Moms Clean Air Force in 2018, Arizona was one of the first states that launched the Eco Madres program. Our Eco Madres in Arizona want those children to be able to work, go to the park and play for hours without having to worry about the negative effects that may have on our children. Our children do not know how to advocate for themselves. And this is why 
through ecomadres, they can have a voice. In ecomadres, here in Arizona, we have been advocating and we have been that voice for our communities that sometimes do not have it. For bold investments in 100% clean energy, for job creation, electric school buses, and a more resilient infrastructure to better protect our children and our communities. Through my work with Eco Madres, I had the pleasure to be appointed by the mayor of Phoenix to participate as a commissioner in the Environmental Quality and Sustainability Commission and the subcommittee on the Urban Heat, Island Trees, and Shake Subcommittee to, to be the voice for my community. At the same time, I was also appointed to be part of the City of Phoenix Electric Vehicle Ad Hoc Committee by City Council Ansari Yasami in South Phoenix and by the Mayor of Phoenix to continue my leadership at a local level. I am an environmental leader because my family and my community needed me to step into this role. My role with Eco Madres is to equip other Latinas and all moms to grow as leaders in our communities because justice will only be served when all of our voices are being heard. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Back to you. Thank you, Columba. A little bit about myself. I was brought to the United States when I was two months old. My parents moved from Mexico to California and then eventually to Nevada in the 1990s. Las Vegas is where I grew up and the place I consider my hometown and where I'm currently raising my four-year-old son. We live in East Las Vegas in the very same neighborhood where I grew up. In fact, East Las Vegas is a neighborhood that is predominantly Latino, about 80%. Most of the people in my neighborhood are immigrants or first generation. And when you walk around my neighborhood, you will hear primarily Spanish speaking as the language uh, that's spoken the most. On any given afternoon or early evening, you will hear the paletero or el otero, regardless of what the weather is like. We recently hit a record in Las Vegas and the official weather was 117 degrees. However, in East Las Vegas, it can be a few degrees higher. Still, the street vendors were out walking in this extreme heat, bringing joy to children like my son, who when they hear the little bell ring, and they automatically know that the elotero or paletero are right out front. While my community is made up of hardworking people that have come to this country to pursue the American dream, they are often the ones left behind in the climate action conversation. We are also the ones that are left behind when policies are being discussed at the local, state, and federal level, even though the impact of those policies will affect this community the most. My son, our Nevada members, my neighbors, and the street vendors whom I have come to know since I have moved back to my neighborhood where I grew up are what inspires me to continue to be in this space. Their voices can no longer be left out of this conversation around environmental racism and how it is that we achieve environmental justice. I am happy that our hard work has been recognized at the state and federal level. And I was honored to be a appointed by Representative Stephen Horsford to serve on his equity cabinet. The cabinet is made up of members from all over Nevada, and we will provide a strateg uh, strategic recommendations and work alongside Representative Horsford on advancing equity and environmental justice, housing, healthcare, education, and workforce development. I was also recently named the chair of the Environmental Subcommittee for the Nevada Hispanic Legislative, Legislative Caucuses Project, called Center for Latino Advancement. The Environmental Subcommittee will serve as a committee that will not just make re recommendations on legislative, legislative action around climate change for the 2023 legislative um, session, but will also serve to educate the Nevada Hispanic legislators on issues around climate change and how it affects their constituents. Now, I would like to introduce Yaritza Perez. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Cindy. My name is Jarisa Perez and I'm from Orlando, Florida. 
As a second generation Puerto Rican, I get to represent the state of Florida as a field organizer for Eco Madre. As a Floridian, a Latina, a United States Marine Corps veteran, and most importantly, a mom. After 12 years of serving in the Marine Corps, I was looking for a new way to serve my country. That's when I found my way to Mom's Clearing Air Force and became a part of the Eco Madres program. My experience in the Marines taught me about service, selflessness, and the importance of leaving things better than how we found it. The Marine Corps taught me to embody the principles of honor, courage, and commitment, and that the safety of our lands was in my hands. No matter what, we must defend it on all fronts, and climate change is one of them. Our state is home to many climate refugees from around the world, not to mention many come to Florida to retire, including a lot of veterans. Did you know that Florida is home to 21 military bases and the majority of them are coastal? Sea level rise and extreme weather is threatening our national security and it's putting the health and the safety of our military personnel and their families at risk. With sea level rise around the state at the rate that is going, we are facing devastating impacts on the very people who swore to defend us. I'm taking this very personally. Latinos have fought in every major conflict this country has been involved in since the country was founded, only to come home and die from a toxic environment and bad health care. Como like, como eso puede ser? Knowing that I sacrificed, knowing that we sacrificed so much to this country, sacrificing time with our families, missed celebrations due to deployments, only to be treated as a second class citizen because of where I live has motivated me to do everything that I can to address these environmental injustices. This is why I've met with representatives Castor and Soto so that they can hear how Latinos and within the communities are being impacted by climate change and air pollution. Congressman Soto's office has been especially helpful in putting pressure on Orlando Utilities Commission regarding the clash acts and lawsuit on toxic pollution from the Stanton Energy Center, which has contaminated local communities' air and water. OUC plans to eliminate coal fire generation by 2027, and they're moving toward net zero carbon emissions by 2050 by investing in solar, en and, solar and energy so solar solutions. Excuse me, <laughs> I'm so excited right now. Transitioning this facility away from coal will go a long way towards reducing this pollution and ensuring the health of local families. Working with our elected leaders is on these issues, help us hold them accountable for the health and safety of our families and our community. Florida also has its own unique difficulties in pushing for climate and public health, most notably has been partisanship. With work, working with representatives from across the state and across the aisle has been one of the reasons why I've been getting so much work done here. We've met with Republican representatives, Maria Salazar and Brian Matt, who have been working on climate issues around the state. I would have never, never imagined that I would have the opportunity to build such a rapport with a congressman. And now his office considers me and my work as an Eco Madre organizer a resource. That's amazing. I'm absolutely honored to have a seat at this table to speak on behalf of those who cannot. This is empowering to know that I'm still able to stand up and defend my community, to continue to fight for a better tomorrow. That's what it's all about. And it has also put me in a place to rediscover my Latinisma. And it also helping me brush up on my Spanish because my Spanish is nobody go looking. But these resources that we have are so helpful. <sighs> Sorry, I just get so carried away with this. For the first time in a long time, I feel like I'm exactly where I belong. I have never been exposed to a work environment like this before. I'm working alongside scientists, mayors, educators, environmentalists, and even tribal leaders, all the way to the halls of Congress, advocating for what is right. That means so much to me and my family. We know that these changes need to be made to avoid a greater climate disasters, which is why we are part of this coalition of organizations to include Sierra Club, Chispa, Citizens Climate Lobby, Volo, and the Clio Institute, and so many others. Together, we are learning and educating Floridians about the toxicity in our communities and what we can do to mitigate these issues. Climate change is affecting all of us, no matter what side of the aisle you are on. It doesn't matter, it doesn't, it's not about being red or blue. 
We just want to keep it clean and green. And our representatives are hearing us. At the end of the day, we're all Floridians. Thank you so much for your service and commitment to our environment, Yaritza. As you can see, the work we are doing with Ecomadres is active both at the local and federal level. We have been very busy so far this year and see no sign of our important work slowing down. Our Ecomadres members have testified twice in front of the EPA for clean car standards hearings. They have also asked the EPA to strengthen the particulate standards and are advocating for the Build Back Better plan, electrification of school buses and cutting methane emissions from oil and gas operations. Strong methane rules are, are important to address climate change and also help protect the health of the 1.81 million Latinos who live within one and a half miles of existing oil and gas operations in the US. In addition to the federal work, we have had a lot of success at the state level in Colorado and New Mexico. We have been working on protections to clean up the air for communities and address environmental justice issues. This includes organizing public comment during the state methane rulemaking process in New Mexico to elevate the voices of frontline communities and holding community events to raise awareness about air, mon air, mon uh, air monitoring near the Suncor refinery in Colorado. Eco Madres also worked closely with partners in advocating and testifying in front of the Colorado State Legislature to pass House Bill 21-1266 which created an environmental justice task force. In Nevada, Ego Madres testified and lobbied in support of Assembly Bill 349, which closed the smog check loophole. And we worked diligently with our partners and bill sponsors to ensure that there was an environmental justice piece. This bill directs the county commissions in Washoe and Clark County to create a voucher program that will help folks that are unable to pay for emissions repairs. Ecomadres has been able to work with a broad range of organizations, both at the state and national level. Our organizers work closely with Chispa in Nevada and Florida. And most recently, we have worked with Climate Power at the national level. Most recently, we worked with Green Latinos, Poder Latinx, Hispanic Federation, Corazon Latino, and EDF on drafting a letter that was delivered to the administration and every member of Congress. This letter focused on the Latino perspective on why and what needs to be done to address climate change. We were able to get 80 organizations to sign on to this letter. The original goal was 50. The Latino community is an extremely important voting block that is rapidly growing. In 2020, the Latino vote accounted for the largest majority block with a record 32 million eligible voters or 13.3 of the vote in the United States. In six out of the seven states where we are currently active, the Latino vo uh, voter share accounts for a higher percentage of the national Latino voter share. Eco Madres has organizers on the ground where the Latino vote will be extremely important. As a result, we are in, in a position where we, are, where we already have organizers on the ground and we have an opportunity to conduct a nonpartisan program to get the Latino vote out during the 2022 election centered around environmental justice and bold climate action. It is important to continue to engage with the Latino community beyond the election. Oftentimes, this community receives a lot of attention around the election, and many organizations that fly into battleground states to get the Latino vote out, they leave right after the election. Those who have stayed on the ground and have invested the time beyond the election are seen as tr uh, trusted voices in the community. Eco Madres is one of those trusted, long-lasting organizations that also brings a unique perspective that many other environmental or social justice organizations have not. Many of us in the Eco Madres program are mothers, and we can share stories about how that has had, uh, climate change has had a, a negative impact on our children's health. Um, also how climate change has a, a negative effect on maternal health. And we as Latina moms are concerned about the devastation that climate change is having on our community, our children's health, and the impact and action on climate change will have on our children's future. Latina moms are a powerful vote within the Latino community and are in a very important voting block. In the 2021 elections, Latinas voted more than Latino men. 
Among 18 to 24 year olds, 44.1% of Latinas voted compared to just 38.4 of Latino men in 2020. In the 45 to 64 age category, these percentages were 61.7% and 58.7% respectively. Echo Madres brings in Latina moms together, and in 2022, we can play an important role in turning out Latina moms to vote. Working at multiple levels of government allows us to work with a variety of community members and make a difference in both the immediate environment and the needs of the Latino community, as well as push for long-term solutions to the impacts of climate change and pollution. In the spirit of Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month, we would like to share to you what it means to be Latina in this space and why we think these efforts are so crucial. As a second generation Latina and veteran, my perspective is a little different. I was born in the Bronx and after enough brutal winters, we made our way down to Florida where I spent my high school years in Kissimmee, just outside of Orlando. I grew up believing that things were equal, well, slightly in our country. And it wasn't until I came back from my service that I started to, and I started to volunteer with various organizations that I realized that there was a great inequality in different areas. One of them being how different communities are affected by climate change. For me, Hurricane Maria and Irma were a huge wake up call. To see the inadequate assistance given to those lives who had been devastated from the Caribbean up into my state and in my city, it really brought it home for me. A large number of climate refugees came to Central Florida alone. Something had to be done. And right there, I found my purpose right in my own backyard. Florida is home to 5.3 million Latinos, according to the 2020 census, with many of them living in communities overburdened with pollution, which is, excuse me, <laughs> which is the case for South Floridians who live next to burning sugarcane fields. And that season is right around the corner. Due to the high levels of poverty, low levels of health insurance, and lack of access to adequate health care, Latinos are disproportionately burdened by the health impacts from air pollution. We are three times more likely to be negatively affected by air pollution because of where we live and work. We live in counties that are frequently violating ground ozone level standards. We're literally living in an environment and communities that are toxic and full of contaminants that are harmful to us and our kids' lungs. We should feel comfortable walking when we're stepping outside knowing that the air is clean. But each of us has our own unique perspective on this kind of work, right? Columba, what does it mean to you? Thank you very much, Yaritza. Being Latina to me, it means listening to mariachi in my car, confusing my daughter when they with their ABCs. When they say A, I say A, ah, and then when they say E, I say E. Eh. <laughs> um, and speaking with this beautiful accent that I have. But also, uh, being Latina, um, it means to me that I bring a perspective and a voice that is often left behind. And that is this voice of the Latino community. Our community experiences environmental racism due to where we work, where we live, and where we go to school. Over 14 million of people of color, only 11% of all American of colors live in counties that receive failing grades on all three measures of air quality used by the American Lung Association. Only 3% of white Americans live in counties with such poor air quality. In Arizona, I have encountered families who during the summer months are not able to afford to pay their electricity bill. They are unable to use air conditioning in their home to keep it cool. This is an injustice that many families with children, even newborns, have to face. Parents have to make a choice between paying for shelter and food on their tables or turning on the AC. This cannot be a health issue as we sh shatter heat records every year. But there are 
other communities that do not have to worry about making the choice. As a Latina in this space, there are some of the stories that I have encountered. Our community feels comfortable sharing these stories with me because of some of the struggles that I had in my own and my family has experienced. I often speak to the media and share these experiences. Having the opportunity to speak to the media on behalf of other Latina moms, it's an honor that I take very seriously. To be featured on Telemundo and other Spanish language outlets gets the message out far and wide. I'm proud of the Eco Madres, what they have done for the Latino community over this past three years. Having materials available in Spanish, taking families to meet with the legislators and holding some of those meetings completely in Spanish. Where moms and dads feel comfortable to share with their elected officials what's really happening in their communities. They not only feel heard, but also empowered that their representatives are hearing their stories. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Columba. For me personally, what it means being a Latina is that many of us who grew up with family members still in our countries of origin have been taught about the land early on. My mom comes from a small agricultural town in Jalisco, Mexico. And normally when you think about Jalisco, Mexico, you think immediately um, tequila and mariachi music and everything that you think of uh, coming from Mexico. Um, and I hold that place close to my heart. And uh, the time that I did spend with my great grandma, uh, my great grandma was someone that never used any Western medicine. And she only wanted to use what our Madre Tierra has provided for all, for all of us. My grandpa owned a small piece of land where each year they grew different crops, uh, primarily corn. I grew up knowing how to recycle without knowing that I was recycling. And this is something that for many of us, it has been passed down to us from our families. I know that I already started teaching my son about recycling and he is already starting to understand what the blue and black garbage cans are for. Being a Latina and someone that's still heavily involved in the community where I grew up, I feel a huge responsibility to make sure that the stories and struggles of our neighbors are being heard. Not just heard, but our policies to be centered around achieving environmental justice. Everything is interconnected from transportation to housing. There are many people in our com community that do not have transportation of their own and have to rely on public transportation. I know growing up, uh, we were one of those families. Uh, we didn't have a vehicle until I was 10 years old and um, we had to rely on public transportation or family and friends that were able to give us rides to the grocery store. And many people in my neighborhood and the Latino community have to work more than one job. A lot of times they have two or three jobs. And as a result, they're not able to drive their kids to school and their kids have to end up riding these dirty diesel buses to school. I was one of those kids uh, growing up. We have been entrusted by our members and our volunteers to help bring attention to their stories and to also help, help advocate for their families. As we move to the Q&A section of this event, I would like to thank you again for your time and for the opportunity to share our work with you. Do any of you have any questions for us? And before we get to the questions, I just need everyone to give a virtual round of applause to these amazing Latina mamas. Like I had goosebumps throughout this whole presentation. Thank you so much for everything that you guys are doing, for all of your efforts, your passion, your drive, uh, your ability to connect with your community and to communicate all of these issues so clearly um, and with so much emotion. And 
I'm just, I'm so grateful to, and I know Michelle is as well, and I don't know if Michelle wants to jump in, it, to have the opportunity to be able to showcase your important and crucial work. And um, I, and we did have actually some questions come in beforehand, um, but if anyone would like to submit any questions, feel free to use the chat feature right below um, and we can move on to the questions, but thank you so much again. I'm like, I'm blown away. You guys are incredible powerhouses and I'm not a, I'm not a mom, at least not yet, but my mom is Latina and there's nothing like a, a ferocious Latina mama. <laughs> you guys get it done. So Monica and I have given a lot of, a lot of presentations together. And I can say without a doubt, this is the first one where I'm like, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. I mean, it was so <laughs> beautiful and just just how honest you were and the work that you're doing is so inspiring. And I needed to hear this today. Um, thank you. Thank you. And and yes, please, please uh pepper them with questions um in the chat. But uh like Monica said, we, we got some beforehand. So so one of the questions that we got uh, for Cynthia, why are electric school buses so important to the Latino community? Thank you for that, Monica. Um, grow, I, I can speak also from experience. Uh, growing up, uh, we didn't have a car and there was really no way for, uh, for me to get to school um, other than riding the school bus. Us. And at the time, uh, while it seemed the best option for me, I had no idea until most recently when I started working with Moms Clean Air Force and Eco Madres that the air that I was breathing, my fellow, um, my friends and, and students now that ride the school, uh, the diesel school buses, that the air inside the school buses can be up to 10 times um, worse than the air that we're breathing outside. And that to me as a mother of a four-year-old who's going to start going to school next year is extremely concerning. And my son, he, he sees the, the school buses uh, sometimes right outside our house, picking up the children around here. And he says, mommy, mommy, I want to ride the school bus. And I say, no, no. Because <laughs> um, we, you know, as a mom, I don't want my child or any other children to have to ride in something that's going to have a negative effect on their health. Um, a lot of times children that have asthma when they ride the school buses, they experience um, asthma attacks. And as a result, they have to uh, not go to school. They have to miss school. And many folks in our community, because of their status, um, a lot of them are undocumented. They don't have access to health care. And so, and healthcare is just off the roof, it's expensive. Um, but also what's disconcerting is that 60% of Latino children have a higher um, chance of experiencing an asthma attack exacerbated by air pollution than their white counterparts. And what's even scarier for me is that 40% of those Latino children are more likely to die from an asthma attack than their white counterparts. So as a Latina mom and someone that's been advocating here in the Latino community, uh, that's why switching to electric school buses is extremely important because what mom doesn't want the best for their kids, you know? And what we want is for our children to be able to go to school and not have to worry about experiencing a headache or they may have uh, an asthma attack on their way to school. We want them to be able to focus in school and be able to um, socialize with their friends and learn at the same time. So that's why we're fighting for electric school buses. Without a doubt, so important. And um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so the next question we have is for Yaritza. What do you think the general feeling about climate change is amongst the veterans you speak with? <laughs> Well, as we all know, veterans are a colorful bunch, um, especially here in Florida, because there's such, I mean, it's every, it's a melting pot. There's such a huge uh, population of veterans who are like, you know, are more a little bit on the Republican side. You know, there are some that are on the Democratic side, but like 
it's just finding that middle ground. And like I was saying earlier in the military, like once I joined the Marine Corps, I was no longer brown, white, nothing. We were all green, just different shades of green. You're either light green or dark green, but we're all green. And that's something that I've kind of kept. And with the veterans that I have spoken to uh, at first, when I talk about climate change, I immediately get like, oh, I don't believe in climate change. And it, if you they try to break it down for them and like how we stay in the Marine Corps, you break it down Barney style. Like, let me explain to you, if we build 80 different plazas with you know all the stores in them, I'm now taking away all that shade canopy from that shade canopy that we can no longer play outside in as veterans that we need for our mental health. Uh, now it's all plazas and concrete. You're literally changing the climate in that area. And like, it's all hot now. Now the heat has nowhere to go. Here in Florida, it's very swampy. It's even more humid and muggy down here, which is gonna change the heat index. Sometimes it could be like 90 degrees, but the heat index will bring us up to triple digits. So trying to break that down to um, some of my veterans, um, it's, it's fun to see them like get the aha and you see the light bulb flickering on and stuff like that, because some of, we've been taught to think and act and behave and live a certain way in the military. Like you just gotta do it, make it happen. This is how we do it. Just So it's, it's fun to teach them. It's also sometimes a little bit exhausting because they, you know, we're creatures of habit and we wanna stay in the same, no, this is how we did it. This is how it's always been. This is how it has to be. But when you try to break it down to them, like, hey, if we don't take care of these little crumb snatchers, we don't take care of these kids now, when we're too old as veterans, look at the issues that our uh, Vietnam and World War II veterans are having now when it comes to their healthcare. If we don't do something good and, and put a positive role model, make a positive impact and take care of the land for these kids now, when they get to be our age and they're supposed to take care of us because we're too old, who's going to take care of us? I want to make sure that they remember the crazy veteran lady with the purple hair. I remember she did something for my community. You know what? I'm going to do something for the veterans when they get older. I remember that she stuck up for me when I couldn't fight for myself. So now I'm going to stand up for her now that she's too old to do that for us. You know what I mean? So just, it's fun to have those conversations. It has been a, a test to my patience. I know I pray to God, like, please give me patience. And he has really been trying it with some of these veterans because it's difficult to talk to some of them. But at the same time, I know that this is a life or death situation. How is it that we're good enough to fight for our country, but our country isn't good enough to fight for us? Like, no, like we need this empty, clean space for us, for our kids, for our mental health. I grew up as an outside kid. So being cooped up all day on Zoom meetings drives me nuts. But then I go outside and it's so hot because they're knocking down all the green spaces that we have to build new parking lots or plazas or shopping centers and like, no. So it has been challenging, but I will say with our generation, with the future generations that are coming up, we're a lot more receptive, especially the moms, especially the moms. Parents are a lot more receptive uh, to listening to these kind of conversations. When you start talking about kiddos, people start to perk up and pay attention. Like, wait, what's going to happen with my kid? You're going to do what? So if we make sure like, hey, they took care. Our parents did as best as they could for us. We need to make sure that we take care of our, our future generations. And like I tell my kid now, and she may not be riding a school bus because she's 20 years old and she's like way past school age. I still now, I'm now worrying about like her future kids. I want to make sure that they have a safe space and a green space to be working in. Could you imagine if by the time she has kids, we have all electric school buses? It would be like the Jetsons, right? <laughs> like finally the future, we're here. So it's, it's a little bit trying at times, <clears throat> especially with the way that society and like how things are outside of the environment, how it does affect people personally and their mental health. But it's so important to have these conversations, no matter how difficult they are, especially with veterans, because, hey, like we got to clean everything up, make sure that it's good, good enough for us. You know what I'm saying? And we're always like, this is the greatest country in America. This is the greatest country in the world. Cool. Let's make it the greatest country in the world. Let's make it the country that we talk about, that it's so good. Right. Well, cool. Let's clean it up. Everybody has time to go out shopping. Everybody has time to hang out with their friends. Do you have time to help out your community? Let's do that, right? So it's it's great. A lot of folks that are retiring here, they have nothing else to do. I'm I'm like helping them repurpose their service, and it's it's amazing. It's literally life changing. So if you guys ever want to come down to Florida for some events, come on down for some coffee, get outside in some green spaces. <laughs> wow, Jadisa. Honestly, thank you so much for your service, and in many ways, because uh, I love what you just said that you're repurposing people's service and and their view on what they can do for the future, not just for themselves, but for future generations and 
eh, you are just such an activist. It's it's in your pores, it's in your cells, you know, like it's clear as day. So eh, thank you so much for, for all of the work that you're doing and um, for such a wonderful answer. You're so inspiring. Um, okay, so then the next question is for Columba. Can you give an example of a community story you feel is important to elevate in the media? Thank you very much. Um, okay. Well, I would like to start with families with having no AC. In Tucson, during the monsoons uh, season, uh, our community sometimes, our AC are, are old. So it's easy for them to just stop working. When they don't know how, who to reach out, sometimes they just stay quiet and they just work around temperatures of 90 degrees inside of their houses. So it's, it's incredible, um, surprising to me that we have the, one of the best technologies in our country, but still we haven't done that transition to clean energy. Um, I will also would like to share how we have bus stops with no shelter um, under 117 degrees. Construction workers or Latino community out there building houses on the mat, on the roof, under 117 degrees, even hotter. Our landscapers, our street vendors on the streets who are trying to make in ends meet. So our communities are truly on the front lines of, of uh, climate change. And the, and the pandemic keeps highlighting all of these issues. Climate change is at the center of healthcare, education, uh, good paying jobs, union jobs, doing our transition to 100% clean energy. And we need resilient infrastructure in our communities. So all of these things that I just mentioned, uh, these topics are so important to me. And these are the things that I try to highlight when, when we get interviewed. So crucial and important. Thank you for sharing, Columba. Um, and it looks like we have just one more question. Again, if anyone wants to submit any more questions, you can use the chat feature. Don't be shy. Take advantage of the fact that we're all here together and we can answer these live. Um, so the next question is for all of you. How important do you think language access from government agencies is to hearing and responding to the needs of the communities you all work with? It's extremely important. And I can give you an example. Um, a couple years ago, right before the pandemic started, the governor of Nevada signed an executive order um, directing the state to come up with a climate action plan. And um, because of the pandemic, they were not able to hold public meetings for the uh, climate um, initiative. And what they did is they held eight listening sessions and they none of them were in Spanish. And um, the listening sessions were going to be where uh, community members could uh, provide public comment and give and testify as to what it is that we needed to see or what we wanted to see. One of the, the listening sessions focused on transportation, another one around solar, um, the other one was green jobs, and um, the other ones focused around lead buildings, all important issues and that affect our community, especially when it comes to retraining our community for these new jobs in the clean energy. And um, I was really disappointed that none of these um, listening sessions were held in, in Spanish. And uh, we worked with uh, the Nevada Environmental Justice Coalition. We're a member, we're one of the founding members of that coalition. And we sent a letter to the uh, governor's office where we, where we said, listen, you have eight listening sessions on this very important issue, but none of these are held in, in Spanish and our community is not able to provide you any feedback. 
And what they did was they ended up doing only one listening session and it was all online. And it was during the day, uh, during the week, midweek when many of our folks are working. And I know um, many people <laughs> like my mom, my dad, they may not know how to hop on Zoom. You had to go at, into a website and register and just like the technology, it just didn't make it easy. And as a result, we were only able to get 16 people um, to go in and provide Spanish comment. And then the feedback that we got from the governor's office was, well, we provided you this, but there wasn't enough participation. Therefore, we can't do another one because we were asking for two and not one. Um, but they just made it really hard and just felt like it was just something that they wanted to check off a box saying we did this um, and that's enough. And then in December, they released the Nevada uh, Climate Action uh, Plan, and it was over 200 pages, none of which were translated in Spanish, not even you know, the main, the top line or anything. Uh, we didn't see anything in the Spanish media about it. So our community, aside from some events that we did around it, they weren't even aware that this, this happened. And then they also had a, a survey and it was just in English we try to get that in Spanish, but they were just saying there's just not enough interest from the community. Same thing happened with uh, Clark County. They're in the middle of doing their climate action plan. And um, because many organizations we joined, they did they did do a website in Spanish. The, their surveys were in Spanish, but they have yet to hold any community meetings in Spanish. Uh, so while we have so many things going on at the state, local, and federal level, a lot of times, yeah, with technology, um, I have seen, you know, with the EPA hearings, a lot more people are able to testify and participate, even with the state legislature, um, because of technology, more people were able to participate. However, there are some communities uh, that just don't either have access to the technology or they don't know how to work the technology. And then on top of that, it's only in English. And so it automatically, if they felt like they weren't able to participate or being heard, they just don't. And I think um, the language access is extremely important. And uh, we have been working through the Nevada Hispanic Legislative Caucus, at least here to try to make that um, something that happens automatically and not just as an afterthought. And that is something that also brought up with Representative Forsberg, uh, making it a requirement that if there are any um, community meetings that they have to have um, language access uh, for folks that need it. And not just in Spanish because there's other languages like Tagalog, um, especially here in Nevada, that's one of our uh, that's another um, uh, span. Uh, that's another language that's spoken here a lot. Thank you, Cynthia. And I see that Jaritza has her hand raised. Yeah, I was just gonna just uh, kind of echo what Cindy was talking about. It's been like I said earlier. My Spanish. I'm New Yorkian, so it is very busted in slang, and we've managed to create our own words sometimes. Growing up, I didn't know how to say environment up until I met. Mom's cleaner person started working with the Ego Madres that we have this information in Spanish. And I was like, oh, that's how you say environment? Like I've been saying environment, you know, we just make stuff up where I talk in Spanglish a lot. But it's been so helpful for me to literally communicate with just my family alone. And like, I thought I was gonna be a Marine forever. I thought that was gonna, so when I got out, I had no idea what to do. And I'm a little bit loud. If you can tell a little bit, I have a little bit of a voice. I figured that maybe God made me a Marine to give my trompeta loud enough so that I can learn this information in Spanish with Eco Madres, Green Latinos, Moms Green Air Force. And now I'm literally like a beacon of information for my community. And at first I was like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. I'm gonna jack this up. Latinos are the most encouraging, like te apodan, like yo no, no, está bien. We hear you what you're saying, just keep it moving. Like it's very encouraging. I've learned how to, and like whenever I wear my Eco Madres shirt, like I always get stopped by a mom. And they just, they so, we want to find out what's going on. What's this mom's shirt that you're wearing? Moms always stop, always stop and ask me if it's my bag, my button. So like being able to sometimes give information, of course, I'm like, but then she's like, oh, no, 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 sabes español. I'm like, 
oh God, my mom's going to get so mad. So I'll just dig in through my bag and I have like two or three of the flyers. I keep them on me. And I'm like, okay, like el medio ambiente está bien mal. Lo que tenemos que hacer, blah, blah, blah. And I'll just start dropping information in Spanish. I would have never been able to do this two, three years ago. And with the insane influx of Latinos, of folks from all over the world coming here. I mean, I live in Florida. This is Orlando. Like everybody and their mom comes down here to vacation. I'm spitting knowledge to people who are on vacation. Like you want to ride the tram? Cool. Let me tell you about the environment because you're going to go back to where you live and you're going to find out about mom's universe in your neighborhood or you're going to go back to the state that you live in and find out that how bad the air pollution really is. And it's been like that with my friends because they make fun of me. They give me a hard time like, oh, here comes Captain Planet. And then within a two weeks, couple months, mira, remember that thing that you posted about? Yo, my kid has asthma or oh my gosh, my tia lives over there. Can you tell me more information? So they give me a hard time about it, but when I'm able to not just give out this information, but I, I give it out confidently, especially amongst Latinos, that says a lot about you, right? Like I'm able to just dump out this information in Spanish, con gusto, with confidence, knowing that not only is it right information, and it, although it might hurt my feelings, it's good information, but that it's te I'm teaching somebody. Like, oh my, I, I don't know about you, but I got chills doing that kind of stuff. Like, I, I, it's so empowering to see other people get empowered. When like, oh, I didn't know that my neighborhood was contaminated. Like, no, I know, because the information's in English and you couldn't read that. So to be able to kind of divulge that information out there, to get them stats in Spanish, so that's where people listen to when they hear numbers, like 70% higher risk, what? then they start digging and asking questions. So it's been super beneficial for me, just for me to learn my own language. Cause I'm real quick to be like, oh, what is what? But like, if I'm gonna be claiming it, I need to learn it, I need to live it, I need to be it. And that's exactly what Mom's Clean Efforts, that's exactly what it, the Echo Madres program has done. Like I said, I'm like, I've never been this way by way by way by ever until like I started working with these amazing moms with these amazing organizations. And it's, it's like-minded people doing really dope stuff you know what I mean and I get to do it in Spanglish <laughs> so we have one minute left thank you um Columba did you want to weigh in real quick before we wrap up on yes. the question of course yes um I just wanted to say that our communities need to know what's happening in our communities in order to protect our families as a mothers, we want all I want we want to do is educate ourselves to better protect my families. I remember when I first joined Moms Clean Air Force, and I started reading all the all the material. I was like, "What? This?" I'm, I started connecting all the dots. Environmental issues and my daughter's wheezing after two months of moving to that neighborhood that we thought it was perfect. Before that, I never heard of that word, environmental issues. Through the, my work with Eco Madres, when uh, I hosted cafecitos, when I went and tabling to Latino communities and they saw this information in Spanish, all I could hear was like, wow, what? Really? Let me read it again. And they will like keep reading it and reading it, turn it around, Asked me for more information, and I was, and I felt, and I felt so blessed to have that opportunity to bring this information to our mothers. Because I can tell you that the Eco Madres here in Arizona are moms that are always looking for more information. They're always looking how can they better protect their kids? How can we better educate ourselves to be better moms? And that's why I felt that connection with Eco Madres. Because podía hablar en español con mis mamás y decirles qué es lo que estaba pasando. But not only, not only that, it's that it's empowering to me. But we, we could give them the tools. I could tell them, we can sign on to these letters. We can sign on to these petitions. We can even write letters. And we will go all get together and tell them why we need to do the change to clean energy. Or we can protest. Or why we had to get together in institu institutional faith and churches spaces 
because that's where we feel more comfortable. And I was able to bring all the information from Echo Madres and Moms to Air Force. We are the heroes of these stories. We can continue to empower our moms and our families, especially in the most vulnerable communities. They are not alone because sometimes we feel like we are alone and we are the only, only ones going through these issues when we have no health care, when we don't have AC access, when we come back home with our baby born and no AC. Old, old spaces where we are afraid of turning the AC because how much is going to come in the electricity bill? We are the heroes because we know how to raise our voices within our community. We can teach our families completely in Spanish to go to Washington DC and be free to speak what's on their minds, how they feel, how have they seen changes in their children when they start wheezing at night or with asthma, respiratory issues, or how they feel their stomachs getting sick or being sick all year because you live in a really high polluted area. So I wanna be thankful to all of you for listening to us, to concern moms. I wanna be thankful for all the leadership with Eco Madres and Mom to Nerf Force and EDF for opening this space. And just let us, as a Latina, Mexicana, who I never thought that I was going to be here and speak about those issues because I would get so nervous. So thank you, Eco Madres. Thank you, Dominique. Mujer, okay, so you did it, now I'm crying. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Chills. <laughs> Piel de gallina, sin duda alguna. Que inspiración, wow. Um, Michelle, I'll let you wrap it up, pero mil gracias a todas. Son una inspiración total. Thank you so much for all of the information that you guys shared, for all of the work that you continue to do. You guys are incredible, um, and we look forward to continue to support the work that you guys do and, and spread the word. Any Everyone that participated, thank you so much for joining. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Michelle. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks to everybody. Many, 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 many thanks to Moms Clean Air Force, Eco Madres, especially Cynthia, Colomba, Yaritza. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, for anybody who wants to get in touch with any of these wonderful people, reach out to Monica or me. We've got more Hispanic Heritage Month events planned for the next few weeks. Go to our Slack channel, Latin, Latinos underscore at underscore EDF if you want to participate. Um, and a special thanks to Dominique Browning for introducing us to this powerful group of women. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. And thank you, EDF, for the work that you do. Um, we'll see you next time. Happy Bye. Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank you so much. Nos vemos.